Okay, we're now joined by Coach Lloyd, and we'll open up questions for the coach. Right here first. Hey, Coach. Uh, Davis Domestic, the Crimson. Coach, you've never faced Dayton in your time in Arizona. In fact, the last time Arizona played Dayton was in 2000 at the Maui Invitational. Now you get that opportunity tomorrow. What do you admire about the Flyers and Coach Grant, and what are you focused on the most strategy-wise headed into, into tomorrow's matchup? Well, you know, they've been a great program for years. And, and I did play against Dayton once in Maui when I was an assistant at Gonzaga, and they beat us. Um, this, I think what you admire about the program is their consistency. And obviously the support there must be tremendous. I mean, I don't know a lot about the job, but when you look at a place that draws fans like they do and consistently wins over multiple coaches, that's impressive. And, and Coach Grant's done a great job. Um, you know, I mean, he, he's, he's, it's, they're, they're a very well-structured program. Um, you know, they, they got a plan. Um, they, they play off their good players, and uh, they do a really good job. And they, they, just, they force you to make a lot of decisions on defense. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, when, when you're on offense, they do a good job, too. I mean, they, they have multiple things they can do, whether it's press, zone, switch coverages in man. So, you know, all in all, I mean, they make you reach deep into your bag. Right here in the middle. Brian Peterson, AZ Desert Swarm. What is the difference between preparing for a morning game as opposed to a night game? Are there any benefits or uh, detractors to I mean, to that? no no real significant difference. The, the only one would be is you, you don't get like a physical walkthrough or shoot around. So you, know, you just have to kind of load up a little bit more uh, the day ahead. But, but this time of year, I mean, you're playing a team you haven't played all year. You're playing a team that you're really not familiar with, and that works both ways. So it's a short prep, so you, you kind of got to rely on what you do and what you do best, I think, at the end of the day. And, and that, that's generally going to be the answer to, to, to your problems when, when facing an opponent on a quick turnaround that you're not familiar with. Right down here in the front. Coach, Alex Snow up here at KSL.com. Um, what's the difference? What's the difference in pl what's the difference in trying to prepare for a first round opponent that you know is hard? Because I know we talked about it yesterday in the press conference. You said the two fifteen game is hard. What's more difficult about a two seven matchup where you're going up against a team like Dayton where you never really faced them before? Yeah, I mean they're both really challenging. You know, I would just say as you as you get deeper into the tournament, usually the teams start getting better, and 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 that's just kind of a logical uh, you know answer. So yeah, we, we know it's going to be a real tough test tomorrow. I mean, Dayton's had an incredible year. They've had an incredible couple years, and and you know it's it's a well-established program, and you know they they definitely have a plan and how they want to play, and they're very comfortable executing that. So we we understand what we're up against tomorrow. Okay, front left, please. Coach Aiden Silly, Arizona PBS. Um, you guys are 19 and one when Kylan Boswell scores 10 or more points in a game. Um, from your perspective as head coach, how have you seen his offensive game progress uh, from last year to now? Um, you know, Kylan's a growing player. I mean, I think we still forget. I mean, you know, he's young. He 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 should be a true freshman this year. I mean, he's he doesn't turn eight. He doesn't turn nineteen for another couple weeks. So you know, he's still young, and and so you know, maybe there's been some inconsistencies there, and and that's probably due to just his lack of experience. But but I see him growing, and I see him growing by the day, and and we all know when he plays well. I mean, there's a good opportunity that that we play well, and and so I, I was proud of how he approached that game yesterday. Those aren't easy games. I mean, those are big moments for for any player, but especially a young player on that stage, and and he did a good job of just. Playing basketball, you know, not not making it more than it is. It's it's literally the same game we've been playing all year, and and I think if you can approach it like that and, and play your normal game, which his normal game is aggressive and physical, um, you know, he's going to have a chance to be successful. So we we just needed him to stay in that lane, and that, that gives us obviously gives us a better chance to do well. Okay, in the back here. Yeah, Tommy, Steve Rivera, AllSportsTucson.com. Can you talk about the importance of uh, having Pella play very well, given, uh, I guess, some analytics say that he's probably the most impactful player you have per minute because he does so much? Yeah, I mean, he, Pella is really good, and I, I don't need analytics to tell me how much he impacts us. Um, he, he impacts every possession at both ends of the floor. I mean, he's a, a guy that, that gives you everything he's got. He's get, a guy that has great attention to detail, plays with amazing effort and energy. And uh, and then offensively, you know, he, he's smart. I mean, he knows what we're trying to do and how to execute it. And, and you know, if we get knocked off our path a little bit, he knows how to get us back on it. So uh, we, we really value Pella and everything he brings to our program. Right here in the middle. 
Uh, Jason Shear, Wildcat Authority. You've had teams try to slow you down throughout the season. What is the, the challenge in facing that, and how do you kind of try to make sure that the game is played at your pace? Well, you, you, you know, you, you also need to be aware when, when you're playing some of these teams that you're, you're not always going to get it your way. So you can't panic if you don't get it your way. I mean, we're, we're built to, to play lots of different styles. Um, you know, and, and generally, if, if you want to be a team that's playing in transition, you better be a good defensive team so you're not taking the ball out of the net, especially these nets, because the ball doesn't come out of them. It just stays in there. Like, you talk about stopping a fast break, I mean, I mean, jeez. So uh, hopefully they have that fixed by tomorrow. Um, yeah, so, so you, and you know, you, you, and then you, want, you have to rebound the ball well. You know, you put those two things together, good defense and rebounding usually gives you an opportunity to play in transition offense. Over here, down front middle. Nick King from 3TV, CBS 5 in Phoenix. Tommy, watching uh, Deron Holmes on film, how do you describe what he brings? I mean, Deron's done a great job. You know, um, you know I, I actually went down and, and watched him, you know, as a young player. Might have been like a sophomore in high school. Um, and, uh, you know, at the time he was more kind of a perimeter-based player and he just continued to grow. I don't think anybody knew he was going to get this tall. And then, you know, he, he went to a Montverde, you know, which is tough to do. And, and, you know, and then, and then came back to Arizona Compass. You know, I think all that was during COVID. And then, you know, this kid was a, a, a top recruit. And, you know, probably could have picked a number of schools, and he chose Dayton. And, and I think he made a great choice for himself. I mean, he's become a player there that's been featured. And, you know, he, he's, his game has really grown, and they've done a good job, you know, helping him become a better player inside the paint. Because that, that's what makes him so tough is he, he plays both inside the paint and out at three. He can drive the basketball. Um, you know, he can get fouled. <coughs> so he just presents a lot of problems. So they've done a great job developing him. <coughs> John? John Kuhn, Associated Press. Um, with this being the final season for the Pac-12, um, final season that Arizona's in the Pac-12, obviously, is, is there kind of like an extra sense of uh, pride in playing for the league and kind of showing people what Pac-12 basketball is about this year? I mean, if you guys want to create that narrative, that's fine. I mean, I know that's easy to do, but to be honest with you, I mean, I'm happy for, happy for the other Pac-12 schools that, that they've all won their first game, but uh, we're 100% we're focused on Arizona, and, and, and I'm sure they're the same, you know. But, uh, you know, I mean, I, 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 I've been in that league three years. I think nationally it's been undervalued, but I, I will say deservedly so because I think a lot of these teams are really talented in the Pac-12. They just haven't played great in the non-conference for whatever reason, whether it's injuries or chemistry issues. But, but I know how talented Oregon is. Yeah, and I know how talented USC is. I know how physical UCLA is. I've seen Stanford at their best. You know, and you, and you could go down the list. So, you know, for me, you know, I've always thought there's no way that these other power conferences, you know, are that much better than us. But at the end of the day, you got You got to do the work. You got to. You got to present the resume to support your argument. And, and the Pac-12 just unfortunately hasn't quite been able to do that because I, I think. Talent-wise, it should be a five or six bid league, you know. I would say for sure in, in, in the last couple of years. But perception-wise, we just haven't been able to get there the last couple of years, and I guess it doesn't matter going forward. Okay, I'm sorry, right there, okay. middle. With uh, the connections between your program and Gonzaga, do you see any possibility of Gonzaga fans? being pro Arizona tomorrow and, and maybe vice versa? And, and how would, would that help you in a neutral site? Well, you, you hope so. I mean, I, I hope so. I mean, I got a lot of great relationships there and it's been fun seeing them around the, you know, the past few days. Um, you know, it's almost surreal, you know, when, when you think about it, because these are people I was around for a lot of years and, and obviously got very comfortable with. And then you kind of remove yourself, you know, f from that setting and, and kind of start a new journey and, and to kind of be, in a parallel with them is it's 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 a little it's a little different, but uh, but it's been great to see everybody, and I hope so. I mean, I know I have a lot of dear friends that I and and I don't think they're rooting against me or Arizona. I think they'll be happy to see us win, and I know my family will be rooting for the Zags, and you know, um, you know, so yeah. Hopefully, hopefully it helps both programs. Okay, center uh, left. Tommy Tom Archdeacon from Dayton Daily News. Uh, just your thoughts on Kobe Brea, and he's pretty pure shooter in the way he rose up, uh, rose up in the comeback and just uh, the courage and the... 
I mean, listen, he's a coin toss guy, which is crazy. I mean, it's a 50% three-point shooter. You know, like, if you flip a coin, he's going to make or miss it. And that, that, that's just that, – that's exceptional shooting. So, yeah, I mean, you, you, you're, you're like, wow. I mean, um, th this is a guy who's got a quick release, a, a good shooting pocket that's high and can get it off, you know, basically when he wants. And they do a great job spacing the floor and putting him in positions where you got to make decisions. So, obviously, an elite shooter and a very good player. And, uh, yeah, I mean, he, he's dangerous. And, you know, it looked like Nevada was having their way with him for quite a while yesterday. And then, you know, I, th I thought Dayton's pressure on defense really – changed the game and then kind of got a few transition opportunities when they made threes and closed that gap quick. And I've been there. When you close that quack, gap quick in a tournament, you know, the momentum shifts, the the feeling in the building shifts. And uh, and, and it could be a lot for a team to like, like the team in the lead to overcome. So uh, just really impressed, really impressed by the, Dayton, their plan, how to utilize their personnel. And obviously they have some elite shooters in, in Brea's number one on that list. Center left, right there. Uh, Coach, I know the the opponents generally get more difficult the, the further you get, but do you think there's something to the belief that kind of getting that first one out of the way, those jitters, that pressure of the the first game of the tournament? I hope so. You know, especially you know after what we Wade went through the year before. I mean, you you got to acknowledge, you know, that was, you know, in the back of you know people's minds. You know, I know I I know it wasn't in the back of people's minds outside the program. I mean, it was probably in the forefront of their minds. Inside the program, you got to admit it's it's on your mind. So I think to to kind of be able to, you know, to to get past that first hurdle, I mean, I I think feels good. And and hopefully it puts us in a position where we can come out and just let it rip and and, and play good normal Arizona basketball. Tommy Caleb and Keisha were just up here, guys that have played in title games talking yesterday about the pressure of this tournament is real. Like, what kind of difference can that make the experience those two have? Well, you hope it allows them to settle in and, and understand that, you know, the, the pressure that the tournament presents is external. You know, that, that's an external force, you know, created by you guys and family and TV. Um, internal, we, we just got to play the game. And, and you really got to break it down in a possession by possession, task by task deal. So, you know, that, that's what we're going to focus on. We're just going to come out and try to play, you know, our best brand of normal Arizona basketball. And, you know, I, I don't think, you know, probably neither team needs to do anything superhuman tomorrow to win. Just probably whichever team can, can play the closest to their normal game is going to have a great advantage. So that's going to be our focus. Okay, front left. Coach, I know you talked about getting dinner with Dan and Mark earlier in the week. Um, did you and Mark ever kind of talk about the possibility if both of you were to advance in the tournament about playing each other? I mean, I, I honestly don't even know what bracket they're in and where they would cross with us, so no. I mean, I, I, I don't even know if we win tomorrow who the, the uh, potential opponents are. I mean, I'm so – we didn't even – and he and I have been together too long. We know how hard this is that I don't think we ever, you know, look past the, the, the game in front of us. Okay, front right. This is kind of a broader big picture question, but like with the all the reviews with uh, out of bounds calls, uh, fouls, do you think there should be more latitude for coaches to be able to, to challenge like they do in the NBA? I mean, and listen, I, I think we got to be open to that thing. Um, at the end of the day, the number one deal is get the calls right. And, and maybe what you're talking about is you know getting those last two minutes where the refs can review everything. Um, you know, should, should you put the onus on the coaches? If you want to review, you need to, you know, you need, you need to basically request one. Um, I, I think that's something interesting to look at. But right now, the way it's said is, hey, it's better than it used to be because the, the calls at the end of the games are getting right. I um, mean, the only issue I had yesterday was there was a couple shot clock issues that were random, you know, and it, and then those ended up in reviews so they can get on the clock. And, you know, basically, I think one, one time – we were on defense, so they basically, the other team basically got, a, at, the, at the end of the half, got a, like a, an extended timeout to put something in the last six seconds when they normally they wouldn't have. I mean, those things get a little bit annoying, but that's just the breaks of the game. Back left. Hey, Tommy, Josh Weinfuss, ESPN. You mentioned the uh, net, and they were working on them throughout the day yesterday. Was it an issue for you guys? Did it slow you down, or do you expect them, do you expect it to be if they haven't changed to be an issue tomorrow? Well, I mean, I, listen. I don't think it's very hard to find nets where the ball goes through. Like, 
you know, so like go up to the University of Utah, take the nets off the basket because they're probably not, not stopping there and bring them down here. It's not complicated. So, I mean, I hope they have the wherewithal to make that change. I mean, it, I mean, I don't know if they stretch them and they can stretch them good enough and prove to themselves it's, it's it, that they're not going to stick. That's fine. The other problem is the ball. I mean, and we've been dealing with this forever. I mean, these are brand new basketballs. And I know they'll probably throw, well, the shooting percentages don't change. There were more mishandles for both teams in our game yesterday because that basketball is brand new. It's just inflated a little different and just different than what the guys are comfortable with every day. And I think it begs the question in college basketball, how do we not have a standardized basketball? How can you play with an Adidas ball one game, a Nike ball the next game, the Rock in the next tournament, you know, a Spalding in this tournament. You know, if you're in the Hall of Fame classic, you're playing with a Spalding. And then you're in the NCAA tournament, you're playing with a Wilson. I mean, come on. I mean, we, I think we can, like, standardize the game a little bit. I, I think it's common sense. So, But, hey, I know there's also a business, and I'm just a coach, so I'm going to get back in my lane. Okay, Coach, we have a Zoom question from KCUB AM Wildcat Radio. Go ahead and unmute your microphone and you're live. Hey, Tommy, David Kelly here in Tucson. Keyshad was really big in that 15 to nothing run you guys had over the two halves to kind of take control of the game. He showed a little bit of everything, had the nice move underneath, step back three, got an alley-oop dunk in transition. In, in terms of his three-point shooting, did you, did you think he could be that considering he had never really taken a lot of threes? At, at, at San Diego State, when did you kind of realize that might be an element he'd be able to add to your offense? Well, it, it's something he and I talked about in recruiting, you know, and then obviously we watched a little film on his shooting technique, and it looked fine. And, um, you know, so we talked, and I, and I told him maybe that's one thing that we would like to add is maybe a little more shooting from our four position. And, um, and he's done a great job. He gets all the credit. I mean, he's really worked hard at his shooting and, and gotten to the point where I'm really comfortable. Like, every three-point shot he lines up, I feel like is going in. And, uh, you know, I, I don't have the stats in front of me to know exactly what he's shooting, but, but I know it's made a really positive impact on our, on our offense overall is just his ability to step out and shoot threes, especially in those corners. And are there common denominators that are happening offensively in some of these games where we've seen you guys be able to make double-digit threes as a team? Well, I mean, uh, you, you probably are starting – the do common denominator is how we're being defended. You know, um, you know, I knew once I really took a deep dive into Long Beach State's analytics, you know, the, the percentage of – you know, three-point attempts by their opponents was pretty high. I mean, just on based on you know, shot attempts. So, so I, I had a feeling they were going to pack it in, and you know, obviously zone us like they did. And uh, and yeah, sometimes to beat that, I mean, you got to play over the top. And uh, you know, 35 threes is you know probably not a number that I would dial up at the uh, you know as we start a game plan. But you know, that's kind of what the game called for, and most of them were really good shots. And for us to make, you know. I think we were 13 for 35 and, you know, probably at one point, you know, before we took a couple late in the game, you know, 13 for 32. And if, if you're shooting that percentage, I mean, I mean that that's really going to allow you to play efficient basketball. Okay. I have one time, uh, time for one last question back in the room here. Yeah, Tommy, historically Arizona's backcourt has been very strong to get them deep into the tournament, even to a national title. You, don't, you just don't have two, you have four. How important is that? And they're interchangeable. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's something we really value. We really value having guards that can kind of share the workload. You know, we're not dependent on, on one point guard, uh, you know, to, to initiate offense for 40 minutes. Um, yeah, so, you know, I mean, that, that's something we're comfortable with. But, you know, other teams are comfortable having one guy that they really settle in with and trust him, you know, with all the decisions. So, I mean, it, it's really valuable for Arizona to have, you know, the guards we have. And we, we spend a lot of time trying to develop all those guys to have all-around skills, to be able to, you know, initiate offense, to be able to, you know, read the ball screen game, to be able to, you know, figure out what coverages other teams are in and find advantages. So um, I'm really proud of those guys. I mean, it's, it's something we take a lot of pride in as a program, is helping those guys develop. And, uh, and, and I think they've really come along nicely. Okay, thank you, Coach. Appreciate your time. Thank and good you luck guys. tomorrow.